Welcome to the Hyper Polyglot Activist. Learn languages, make a difference. My name is Dr. Carlos Diego Lopez, and today I want to talk to you about three steps through which to revitalize a language thanks to AI chatbots. As you know, out of the 7,000 languages that are supposed to exist nowadays in the world, around half of them are endangered. Now, ChatGPT4, BART, etc. can only interact in a handful of languages, around 40, 50, maybe 100, 200 in the future, but that's still a long shot from the total amount of endangered languages in the world. So if you have decided to either create a chatbot from the ground app in the language that you're trying to revitalize or else train an already pre-existing chatbot, into the language you want to preserve. This video is for you. Let me share full screen and off we go. Essentially, the three steps are data work, training and application and impact. Now, when it comes to data work, the first thing we need to do is to collect the data set in the target language we want to revitalize we need to gather a both large and diverse data set. You need to tap into different genres and topics. So use literature, but also historical texts, everyday conversations, contemporary content, so that you can touch upon every single angle of that language. Traditionally, this was a huge barrier because endangered languages tend to be low resource languages, which means there is not a large data set available and since the data set is not large enough then it used to be the case that we couldn't train a chatbot in that target language nowadays technology allows for us to train a chatbot on a limited data set so that shouldn't be a problem i will focus more so on the diversity of that data set in terms of genre and topic once you have that data set sorted, then you need to engage in what is known as pre-processing. This stage is all about cleaning and managing that data. The idea is to remove anything that prevents a smooth analysis, to remove any noise, errors, irrelevant content. This stage is actually complicated. It requires experts in natural language processing and includes tokenization, sentence segmentation, which is a form of constituency parsing, and other language-specific pre-processing steps, which are essential for preparing that data for training. So here, if you are a language expert in the endangered language in question, you need to team up with natural language processing experts as well. You're going to need a broader team, not just yourself. So what is tokenization? Essentially, it's the process of breaking down a piece of text into small units. Now, those units are called tokens, and they might be entire words or parts of a word or just characters like punctuation. Of course, successful tokenization necessitates from collaboration between a language expert in the endangered language in question, on the one hand, and an NLP, natural language processing expert, because only the language expert knows well enough the grammar and structure of that language for him or her to advise the natural language processing expert on how to fragment that. And vice versa, only the NLP expert assesses the expertise required to know how to break those texts into small units. Now, you might be asking yourself, what if I actually have audiovisual data rather than textual? Well, then you have to convert that audiovisual data into text and then process the text. And then we have constituency parsing, which is an NLP technique that is about syntactic analysis. It is about identifying the constituents or subparts of a sentence and then analyzing the relationship between those parts. For instance, subject and predicate, within the predicate, the verb and the complements. I'm sure you are all familiar with these syntax trees. Those are a form of constituency parsing. Now, we're done with the first stage. 
And then the second one commences, which is training. Now, training is the most complex stage. I have breaking it down here into six steps. This does not mean that the steps are necessarily strictly sequential. It might be the case that you have to go to step three and then to step six and then back to number four. But for analytical purposes, I've breaking it down into six. The first step is the framework, and this is critical. You need to make three choices. First, you need to select a chatbot that already exists in the market, unless you want to create your own chatbot from the ground up. If you do not want to do so, then your choices are pretty much OpenAI's ChatGPT4, Google's BART, or Microsoft's Bing AI. These are the three main ones. There are, of course, many more options. Now, if you are trying to generate both spoken and written content, then I think your choice should be Google's part because spoken content is native to that chatbot. Whereas in the case of Microsoft's Bing AI and OpenAI's ChatGPT4, you need plugins, you need text-to-speech tools to be implemented on top of the chatbots. Then you need to pick an open source framework. Now, each of the chatbots that I already mentioned works on different open source frameworks. So once you have chosen a specific chatbot, you do not necessarily have the choice to pick and choose specific open source frameworks. The main ones are TensorFlow and PyTorch. I think that TensorFlow is the one that lets itself best to the inclusion of spoken content as opposed to written one. So that's something to bear in mind as well. And finally, depending on whether your team is large or not, you might need to engage into collaboration platforms. If your team is a large one, collaboration platforms are a must, such as GitHub, for instance. But if it's not too big, if it's just one, two, or three people, collaboration platforms are not necessarily a prerequisite. Now, once you've made all these three choices, fine-tuning comes up. And so you need to fine-tune or calibrate a pre-existing language model. In the case of Google Spart, it will be Palm 2, etc., using the collected data set. So you're going to use the collected data set against that language model and see how you can reconcile both and things you need to tweak and or improve. Again, here, the language expert in question is going to need the help of the more technical staff concerning NLP and machine translation. Number three are hyperparameters. In this stage, you will be able to experiment with different metrics with the learning rate, with the batch size, the sequence length, etc., And it is on the basis of those hyperparameters that you will be able to optimize the performance of the model for the language that you're trying to revitalize. Again, what hyperparameters you choose is as important as how you train the language model on the basis of that choice. Number four, model evaluation. Now you need to assess the performance of that trained model by, first of all, developing and choosing evaluation metrics and then see how that language model performs on those. The evaluation metrics depend pretty much on the things that you value the most in your trained chatbot. It might be the case that you're looking for fluency or for coherence or for how sensitive is that chatbot to the cultural nuances of the language you're trying to revitalize. Probably you need all three and then some more. You're also going to need human judgment, things that those metrics are missing and that are intangible that only human beings can detect. And here, Human beings are not only the people that are within the team, but also probably the community of speakers of the language that you're trying to revitalize. So you want to hear their feedback before assessing the performance of that language model. So again, this is trial and error. You cannot rush these steps. Now, once you've gone through all of the assessment and now that you're happy with the way in which that trained language model performs in the target language, then you want to engage in content generation. Then you want to use that trained model to generate both spoken and written content in the language in question. And it is also almost just as important to design 
an interface that is user friendly, that people at home without the language expertise, without the natural language processing and machine translation expertise can use. And here again, you're going to want to have the feedback of the community of speakers of that language. And then on the basis of their experience, you can adjust accordingly. And finally, just in case it wasn't clear enough, you're going to repeat again and again and again all of these stages until you are satisfied with the performance of your chatbots. You might need to collect more data. You might need to engage in more fine tuning until you achieve satisfactory performance. So those are stages one and two, the data set, the training, what is the last stage? It's the application and the impact. Now, as far as the application, you're going to now create apps through which users can interact in your target language. It could be a chatbot that you build from the ground up if you didn't just train a pre-existing chatbot in your target language. It can be a language learning tool or content generation tools in the target language. And finally, but as I said, this is not necessarily sequential. You're going to want to include community members throughout the entire process. Community outreach. Once you are sure that your trained chatbot can actually interact and produce coherent, culturally sensitive and fluent spoken and written content in your target language, then you showcase your gift to the world and you proceed to engage in massive community outreach as opposed to the more selective community outreach in which you should have engaged for the purpose of fine tuning your chatbot. Now it's about reaching out to as many people as possible that might appreciate interacting with a chatbot in your target language. And then here, I think it's very important to realize that rather than conceiving of your chatbot as a once and for all done finalized product, you should conceptualize it as something that should always be a work in progress, open to innovation, to improvement and amelioration. So that's all from me. I hope now you have a clear understanding of the three steps to revitalizing a language using an AI-powered chatbot. As you've seen, this is rather a panoramic view. If you have any specific questions, please leave a comment down below. And if you have a more of a research question, book a consultation on the hyperpolygotactivist.com. All in all, I hope that this was useful and or inspirational for you when it comes to either developing a chatbot from the ground up in the language you're trying to preserve or training a pre-existing chatbot into that language. And as always, thanks for watching.